My name is Kyle Jackham. I'm a licensed social worker and program coordinator for Crossroads for Hope, formerly known as uh, Cancer Support Community Center in New Jersey. In partnership with Systemetic, we are happy to welcome you to 10 Deadly Assumptions About Healthcare Costs. Our presenter today is Sue Knoll. Sue, uh, Systemetic is a nationally recognized medical bill advocate that helps businesses and individuals oversee and manage medical uh, expenditures. Through a detailed process of education, auditing, and advocacy, we help uh, reduce vulnerability to unforeseen, unmanageable, and unwarranted medical expenses. Systematic empowers individuals to take control of their medical expenses and become more strategic healthcare consumers. We address both issue prevention, um, what to want, what to know, and ask about ask before using medical services and resolution, resolving billing errors or negotiating medical bills. They focus on the details of medical, bill, medical coding and billing to ensure that medical benefits are maximized and unintended expense, expenses are minimized. By focusing on coding details and other billing practices, we work to uncover billing errors and overcharges that reduce costs for our customers. Our goal is to save you time, money, and stress. Sue shares part ownership of Systematic and brings more than 30 years experience in marketing and client service to the table. She has spent the last 14 years providing frontline support to the company's medical billing and advocacy clients, focusing on negotiating with insurers and medical facilities. As the daughter and sis of and sister to a general surgeon, pathologist, and orthopedic surgeon, Sue brings a lifetime of inside exposure to medicine and insight used every day as, as she advocates for our clients. And be, uh, just to be sure to keep yourselves on mute to be respectful to our presenter and other attendees and um, feel free to drop any questions or comments that you have in the chat box and we'll be sure to address them at the end of the presentation. And I just wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Um, Sue, I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay, thank you, Kyle. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for coming today uh, to uh, learn a little bit about the financial side of health care, uh, hopefully a little bit more than what you might already know at this point. Um, what I've put together uh, to discuss with everyone today is really like a first step into understanding how to take control of the financial side of your health care. Um, there's this is such a foreign language to almost everyone who, does, who isn't involved in it every day that it's virtually impossible to teach yourself how to do this unless you've been thrown into it um, in a given situation. And that isn't always the best way to learn um, because you often learn the hard way. So um, over the years of um, having worked from the provider side as well as the advocate side, um, we've put together um, 10 questions, really 11 now, because one focuses on COVID-19, um, that are at least are um, a beginning point of things to think about um, as you're looking at bills that might come your way, or as you're considering um, health healthcare treatment, questions that you might want to ask in advance of that care. Because so much of what you need to do is to learn how to ask the questions in advance of the care so that you avoid the, the unintended expenses after the fact. So much e easier to deal with it before than it is after and the money has already been spent. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'll just hopefully if I click a button, this is gonna do what I want it to do and we'll all be in the great, okay. Um, so I hope everyone can see. We can uh, see it. Assumptions, okay. So um, let's just uh, dive in. These are all the things that you um, didn't know you needed to know about your healthcare. Uh, the first question. Um, I have the same insurance that I had last year. I assume my coverage hasn't changed. The one thing you have to learn is you can't assume anything at all as it relates to your healthcare, particularly on, from the financial side. Policies change every year. You may have the same card in your hand. You may work for the same employer. You, you may have purchased the same policy. Chances are something changed. Perhaps many things might have changed behind the scenes. And those are the things you need to be aware, be aware of. Some of the main things you wanna make sure that you check is check your co-pays, make sure that they haven't changed. Know what the difference is between a primary care um, visit copay versus a specialist copay. 
See if your plan requires that you pay a coinsurance. A coinsurance differs from a copay as a copay is a flat fee, where a coinsurance is a percentage of the charges that you would be responsible to pay. In a small visit, that doesn't account for much, but in a, in a large hospital stay or a lab bill or something, you could be talking significant money. So if your policy requires a 30% coinsurance on all your charges, you're gonna to wanna to know that in advance. Um, deductibles, there are, I think, ex very few policies at this point that have zero deductibles. If you have a zero deductible plan, count yourself really, really lucky. At this point, everyone has deductibles and they're just rising. So what that means is that you, we are all self-funding our health care up until that point. Um, so if you've got many and ongoing expenses, um, then you obviously would like to reach your deductible as soon as possible. If you have fewer expenses, you have to understand that this is something that you might be self-funding throughout the year. Um, covered services change. Um, including, I'll jump to prescription coverage, formularies change. So drugs that may have been covered on your plan last year might not be covered on your plan this year. Services that were allowed last year may be disallowed this year. Um, so if you know that there are things that you um, use on an ongoing basis, you're going to want to question that every year and just see, has there been a material change in your plan or not? Um, so that you're aware of that in case you want to make some modifications. And doctors' networks change all the time. Um, understand that the networks are created by the insurance company. They are not created by the doctor or the facility. Um, and it is altogether possible that some doctors may not know if they participate in your particular plan because as deductibles have gone up, and premiums have gone up. Insurance companies have created more plans um, to create lower premiums and um, lower, lower costs. Uh, along the way, what that means is, in some instances, they've carved out a smaller network of doctors. So your doctor may, for instance, partici participate with their um, local Blue Cross Blue Shield, but if you bought a plan that was on the exchange, that doctor might not participate with the programs on the exchange. And even though that doctor is a Blue Cross Blue Shield doctor, that doctor is not going to accept your Blue Cross Blue Shield plan from the exchange. So that's just one of many different scenarios that might occur. But what, what I want people to walk away with is don't assume just because your insurance is the same that, that everything stands the same as it was last year. Check on these important points and just be aware as you start new services that you haven't incurred before, start to ask the questions about what your coverage might be. Next question. I'm entitled to one free physical each year without cost to me. The problem here is what's the definition of free physical? Um, there is a organization called the US Preventive Services Task Force that um, you can look up online um, that provides guidelines um, based on um, age, um, if you're male or female, um, what services they believe should be considered as preventive um, for, for you as well as to be considered by your insurance company. That does not mean that your insurance company is going to agree with, with that or that they're going to use them. Some of them base everything on whatever um, the US Preventive Services Task Force indicates as preventive service. Other plans just decide whatever it is that they want. And these things vary by plan. So once again, um, taking Blue Cross into consideration, where one Blue Cross plan may cover everything that a doctor might um, undertake in a physical, another Blue Cross plan may not. Um, and keep in mind that a physical is, all, all services are built on, by coding. Um, first of a five digit procedure code that indicates what's services being provided, and then secondarily, um, a um, diagnosis code that indicates the reason the service is being done. So that's how everything is built. In a physical, there's not just one code for a physical. There is a code for a certain portion of the physical, but then a physical that a doctor will uh, put together will include all kinds of tests, all kinds of blood tests, 
Um, they could do an EKG, they might do spirometry, some might do some ultrasound tests, some could do hearing tests, some might do vision tests. It could be a wide variety of things. Ask 12 doctors what they include in their physical, you'll get 12 different answers. So um, it takes a little digging to find out really what's going, what is going to be covered. So the doctor's office, unfortunately, will not be able to tell you for certain what things are gonna be covered and what won't. They may know in general, but they will not know specifically because the insurance company won't tell them until after the claim has been submitted. So what it means for you is, oops, that you need to um, do a little bit of homework. You, My suggestion is that before going in for your physical, you ask the doctor's office, please give me the procedure codes and the diagnosis code that you're gonna be used when you bill this, this encounter that I have and then call your insurance company up and say, this is the doctor I'm going to see. These are the tests Then the procedures are gonna be performed. Please tell me how you're gonna cover this. They will tell you, they will not tell the doctor. So they will be able to tell you, oh, everything is gonna be covered at 100% or no, you know what? We're gonna charge you a copay against the EKG or that ultrasound test is not covered at all as a, under wellness. It is covered under your other standard benefits, but we're gonna apply that to your deductible. And since you haven't met your deductible this year, you're gonna be responsible for the full allowed amount on that charge. So at that point, you're gonna have a good sense of what you may owe for this. And then you can take that information and go back to the doctor and say, do doctor, do I really need to have this test now? It's not going to be paid by my insurance company. I can't afford to pay it right now. It's not something that I wanna pay right now. And then you can have that discussion with the doctor and determine whether you actually want to incur the expense or not. After the fact, you've already incurred the expense and then you're at the whim of the practice to determine whether they're gonna write off a charge or not. Um, so again, this takes a little bit of legwork, uh, but could save you significantly. Um, my doctor knows what insurance I have, so I don't need to worry about anything not being covered. Um, doctors don't know anything about a lot of things as it relates to insurance, no matter how many claims they submit. But in particular, what they don't know is specifically what your policy does and doesn't cover. There are just too many of them out there. There's no way for them to keep track of them all. And again, as I said before, just because your policy last year covered everything that was in that physical doesn't mean that your policy this year is going to. And I've seen that time and time again um, where changes have occurred from, from one year to the next. Um, ultimately, in the end, you're responsible uh, for to know the specifics of your plan. It's not your doctor's responsibility. It's your insurance policy. It's, it's not theirs. So you really do have to take some of this responsibility, if not most of this responsibility, onto your shoulders. All that the doctor's office is truly responsible to tell you is what they're going to bill and how they're going to bill it and provide you with the appropriate information that you can take back to the insurance company um, to, to ask your questions about. Um, Additionally, uh, just understand that most doctors will have had you sign um, at the first point in which you registered to come into the office, buried deep in the millions of papers that you filled out is something that were, uh, involves their um, uh, financial policies. And there's always some kind of wording in there that indicates that, um, that they're gonna submit the claim to your insurance and that you've agreed that whatever is not covered um, or not covered um, fully will be your responsibility uh, to pay. So um, again, they've got that um, in a sense protecting them. E-scribing saves time and money. E-scribing uh, is the, the latest version of how people get their prescriptions. Um, in the state of New Jersey, you still can have a paper prescription that the doctor can hand to you that you can take to your pharmacy to have filled. In the state of New York, you can't do that. Everything is done electronically through e-scribing. Um, and this is often why uh, doctors are now asking you for your, um, you know, what uh, pharmacy do you like to have your prescriptions filled at? Um, because if there's something that they have to fill, 
all they need to do is go online, fill the prescription, it goes directly to whoever it is that you've indicated, um, and then all you have to do is pick it up. Well, that seems to make a lot of sense um, that, that it gives you less that you have to do, but it doesn't allow you to do any price shopping. So when you show up at the pharmacy to pick it up, you don't know, do you owe $20, $200, $2,000? You have no idea how much you're gonna owe. And you don't have the ability at that point to price shop it because you don't even know what they prescribed other than telling you, they might tell you, well, this is what I'm gonna prescribe or I'm gonna prescribe something for, for you. You may not even know. So um, with the price of drugs these days, you could be looking at significant numbers. Um, and what we have found is that prescriptions can be found at much lower costs outside of the pharmacy benefit allowance on your plan. So, um, you know, when you have an insurance, you, you, you know, I'm gonna use Blue Cross again, poor Blue Cross today, um, Blue Cross, then they're gonna have a pharmacy benefit manager that they use. So you, you think your prescription is through Blue Cross, but it's really not, it's through Optum or it's through um, it, whoever the organization is, the pharmacy benefit manager that the, the Blue Cross has contracted for on your particular plan. Um, and, and they then administer um, uh, all the expenses outside of it. So it doesn't mean that um, their prices are the best. Their prices should be reduced, but because they're formularies and their levels of formularies, some things will cost you more or less depending upon where you go to actually um, have that uh, prescription fulfilled. Um, and even we found even some generic drug prices can vary uh, pretty widely by um, fulfillment option. Um, so again, with a little bit of legwork, you could potentially save yourself a lot of money, particularly when you have a chronic situation and you know you're gonna be taking a certain drug on an ongoing basis. You wanna make sure that you're not overpaying um, for, for that um, particular medication. There are places like GoodRx and Blink Health and a ton of others who have um, come into the marketplace these days um, that if you can get your doctor to give you the name of the drug the, and the dosage, um, you can go online and, and quickly plug in and see, are there coupons available that will give you a reduced fee? Um, are, are there special offerings at other locations? Um, and you can compare that by calling up your, the pharmacy benefit manager on your plan and finding out what it's gonna to cost to be um, fulfilled at the pharmacy that you normally would have uh, fulfilled it at. Um, there may be better options for you um, for mail order. Um, places like CVS are trying to combat that by offering 90 day um, prescriptions and giving discounts on them at that point. So there's, there's a lot of, um, volatility going on in this marketplace um, and on uh, certain drugs that um, may be um, off your formulary or very expensive drugs on your uh, formulary, you often, or I didn't say often, you sometimes can go directly to the manufacturer and see if there's special programs that they offer that might help further reduce the costs for you. So this is certainly an area that you should explore um, if you've got um, significant um, uh, drugs that you are taking because it can save you an awful lot of money. Oh, and then I missed that one. The best for you is driving once you've predetermined the best cost, but also keep in mind that costs will vary. Um, so you may find that one time you renew it, it's one price and the next time the price has gone up. So um, it's something you have to really pay attention to. Okay, I'm scheduled for surgery with an in-network doctor and facility, so I don't expect any bills. Um, again, you have to really try to avoid making assumptions about everything because a surgery is entails more expense than just the surgeon um, and the facility. We have anesthesiologists, you have radiologists, potentially, potentially pathologists, assisting surgeons. There can be all types of other providers who are gonna bill separate and distinct from um, the facility and the surgeon. And you wanna make sure that they're in your network. 
because just because the surgeon and the facility are does not mean that any of these other specialists who might be brought in will be. So it's a question you wanna ask at the start um, from your surgeon um, and or from the facility and you have to ask each to kind of make sure you get all the answers. And it again, will require a few phone calls, uh, but you, again, a few phone calls can save thousands. Um, you want to, wherever you've written any paperwork that's been filled out, you wanna make sure that you've written down that you are only approving um, providers who are in network with your, with your plan um, for surgery. That can help to pre prevent someone who's out of network from coming in because you've actually written it down someplace that you have not um, given authorization for any out of network care. Um, yes, there are um, surprise medical bill laws that do exist in both New York, New Jersey, and New Jersey and Connecticut as well. Um, however, those really pertain to situations that are emergency. So on an emergency basis, if you were to go into the emergency room, be taken into surgery on an emergency basis, and all these um, providers were brought in who are out of network, it protects you there because um, you did not choose for all those things to happen. It happened on an emergency basis. But when you have a planned surgery or, or, or planned services that are being provided, you then lose that protection from the surprise medical bill law. It's not considered a surprise medical bill. Even if it's surprised to you, it's not surprise in, in the face of the law. Um, and again, I always recommend get codes, procedure codes wherever you can so that you can clear them with your insurance company because they are the ones who are gonna make the, the ultimate decision about covered or not covered. Um, and you wanna hear it from them. Uh, and again, um, what I probably didn't mention before is any conversation with any insurance company and any provider, um, pretend you're back in school and you're taking detailed notes. You're, no, you're notating the day and time that you called, you're notating the name of the person you spoke to. If there's a reference number for the conversation, you're notating that. You're getting every piece of information down on paper uh, because most of these calls will be recorded. And if there's ever a discrepancy between what you were told and what actually happened, um, if uh, what you were told was correct and they acted separately from that, that phone call can, can save you. Um, they have to, if, if their rep, um, gave you incorrect information, that's on them, uh, and they have to, uh, they have to stand by um, what you were told because you relied on that information um, for services. <clears throat> I don't need to worry about how my doctor gets paid. I have insurance. You always have to worry about how your doctor or your facility gets paid because the bottom line is that uh, these claims are just going through computer systems and nobody's looking at them and errors are made. And, and in the end, that bill comes to you. And if they say you owe the bill, you owe the bill until you fight it otherwise. Um, you do need to take a very active role in this uh, in order to avoid there being issues for you. Um, it's your responsibility to comb through every line um, to make sure that the service was coded correctly, it was processed correctly by the insurance and it, that it matches up whatever the insurance company says on your explanation of benefits matches up with the bill that you received. Um, uh, that's really your responsibility um, uh, to go through and the other organizations are not going to do this for you. If, if they're being told that you owe a uh, bottom line, that's all they see in the computer and that's all their representatives are going to see until you question it otherwise. And again, question discrepancies, make sure you get answers. You are entitled to answers. You are entitled to answers that make sense. And when somebody gives you an answer that doesn't make sense, you have all the right in the world to say, I'd like to speak to your supervisor and move up to the next level. And oftentimes you need to move up to the next level because unfortunately the first level of people who are available on, on uh, uh, patient um, uh, calls uh, and insurance companies and facilities often don't even know what they're talking about. So you can very easily get incorrect information. So if it doesn't sound right to you, doesn't seem correct, make your way up to someone who knows what they're talking about. 
Oh, here we go. Poor Blue Cross. I'm so glad Blue Cross offers a policy on the exchange because it's the only insurance my doctor accepts. This goes back to what I was referring to before, that um, being an in-network with an insurer doesn't mean that that in, um, provider facility is in-network with every plan that insurer offers, and in particular, does not mean they accept the exchange plans. These exchange plans were made to be uh, whittled down to make them less expensive for people. And when you do that, mean, that means something goes. It's not that you got a better deal out of it. It means that you're probably being offered um, a, a more narrow set of services, um, both potentially in terms of the network that's being offered as well as the services that are being offered as being covered. Um, and you want to confirm that network status before you enter um, any new encounter that you're not sure of. And you want to uh, confirm that with your insurer, because again, they're the ones who create the networks, not the provider. They're going to know, they have your policy right in front of them. They can put in the doctor's NPI number and pull them up and see if they're in your plan or not. The, the doctor and the facility don't have that kind of type of luxury. You want it confirmed by the insurance company and then you wanna make a note of who told you that was true um, because if something then all of a sudden gets processed out of network and they told you incorrect information, well, they gotta stand by what they told you. Um, and as I had mentioned before, in the networks are created by the insurers, the pro providers just hold the contracts. The only case in which that differs a little bit is in the case in which a doctor has determined that they are going to now um, get out of network with a particular plan. So they most likely will know in advance of having told the insurance company that they're going to get out of the plan, but then they should very well be able to tell you, well, the doctor's getting out of that plan um, as of a, a certain date uh, in the future. Um, my plan doesn't require that I select a primary care physician, so I won't. Um, there are plans that um, don't require that you tell them who your primary care physician is going to be, um, but there are others that do. And the plans that want you to tell them often will tie the copay that you're going to pay to your having told them who the primary care uh, doctor is. Um, telling them actually helps you a little bit because if you tell them and then they tell you the doctor's not in network, at least you know that from the start. Um, but it, what it means is that if you are required to tell the plan who your primary care physician is and you don't, um, that means that any claim that comes into them, they will determine uh, and, and a review as if it were um, a specialist. And so they're going to apply a specialist copay to all of those visits, even if it is your primary care doctor. So it's a lot easier just to do it up at front than to have to undo the mess afterwards to correct them. Um, so you want to just confirm what the requirements are by your plan and what the impact might be um, on your copays. Again, these things are all um, uh, legwork that you need to do in advance, but it really will save you aggravation um, down the road because once something has been done incorrectly, undoing the thing that's incorrect takes a lot more time and effort than what would have gone into it if you, if you had set it up in advance to, to work for you. Uh, my doctor sold his practice to a hospital. He's still in the same office and I was told that nothing has changed. Well, that's not necessarily um, true. Um, the, the people and the facility, the surroundings may all be the same, but how the structure is now put together is different and it's under the new umbrella organization, hospital or a large group practice, whoever they were sold to. Um, the reason that doctors will sell their practices uh, and have been selling their practices more these days um, is because they can't compete in terms of um, their fee schedules. Um, when a doctor is in network with, a, with a pro, a, an insurance company, for each and every uh, 
procedure code that they provide, there is an allowed amount that is determined by contract with those insurers. So regardless of what they charge, it could charge $500 for a service, but if their allowed contract only is $125 for that $500 charge, as long as you've gone in network, the, the most that you can be responsible to pay is $125. Well, what's happened with the independent and smaller independent doctors in the smaller groups is that as a as a one or two or three person practice, you have no leverage to negotiate with these um, large insurance companies. So for the same services, the practices affiliated with hospitals are getting a hundred, sometimes a thousand times more than what they've negotiated in their contracts and they can't afford to maintain independent practice. And this is why, one of the reasons why they sell to practices. So in these instances, their fee schedules have now gone up. Now you might say, well, that doesn't really matter. I'm going to somebody who's in network, but when you have a high deductible, um, that means that you're, you're going to be paying um, more for those each and individual visit because now the fee schedule is higher. Um, so you're going to want to be aware of that um, before you go into it to know that, um, I mean, I've seen doctors, uh, cardiologists who get reimbursed like $25 or $30 for an EKG for uh, that was done in their office independently. But when they became um, part of a practice of, of a hospital, they were getting three and $500 for the same procedure code. So again, the things that go on are pretty amazing and you wanna really make sure that you protect yourself. Um, what issues should I look for regarding COVID-19 bills? Um, in the beginning, when a year ago, when COVID first hit all of us, th this was a total mess. Um, the government had decided and the insurance companies had decided at one level that they were covering everything and don't worry, don't worry. But it took forever for that information to get all the way down into their systems and to the people on the phones um, and claim after claim was being processed incorrectly. They've now gotten past all of that. Um, Medicare, Medicaid, and most commercial insurers are covering all, all testing and treatment for COVID-19 related services without any cost sharing, including vaccination now. Um, but there still are um, caveats. Uh, Self-funded plans um, can opt out of this waiving of the cost share. Now, a self-funded plan is a plan that is actually funded by the employer itself. Very large groups like unions and very large corporations will often self-fund their insurance because it's less expensive for them to actually be the insurer who pays out for each and every claim than it is to pay premiums for all their employees. Um, and as a self-funded, employer-funded plan, they can determine what the criteria are um, on cost share. And that's separate and distinct from what goes on in a fully funded plan, which is a plan that you would get from an Oxford or Blue Cross United Healthcare. That's a traditional type of a plan. So if you work for a, a large company, you want to, you should really want to know if you're self-funded because it does impact a lot of things, particularly if there are um, billing issues and, and um, um, appeals and things down the road. Um, telemedicine visits, which a lot of people have taken advantage of um, because of COVID-19, um, have been expanded and HIPAA requirements have been relaxed so that you can have a telemedicine visit on your um, phone through FaceTime. You don't necessarily have to use a HIPAA compliant resource to provide um, that service, but that will potentially change in the future and that could potentially change whether that visit is gonna be covered or not. Um, telemedicine visits in the beginning, um, once they finally got their act together, were covered for everything COVID related and not COVID related because they didn't want people going to doctor's offices, they wanted to protect doctors, they wanted to protect patients. But now since we're past the, the the greatest emergency in their estimation. Um, a lot of the um, insurance companies are backing off the non-COVID related 
um, cost sharing. So they're not saying they won't pay for telemedicine. They're paying for telemedicine visits. But if that visit is for hypertension, um, not before, because you think you were exposed to someone who, who had COVID, then they're going to apply cost year to that visit. And cost year means that you're going to pay a copay. Um, and in the instance where you have a deductible, that visit's going to get applied to your deductible and you're going to pay for that visit. Um, so that's something to be aware of. Um, and the one thing that you can know for certain that as it re relates to anything that's COVID-19 related, the coverage requirements are changing all of the time. So you do want to try to um, be as careful as possible and, and calling your insurance company and asking them in advance of going for testing um, um, as well as going for, for treatment at any point to make sure that those requirements, those those coverages haven't changed. I just received bills from the ER, my doctor, a lab and an ambulance company, I guess I need to pay them. I would never pay a bill for a medical care without going through a detailed itemized bill code by code, line by line, to make sure that you aren't overpaying uh, because mistakes do happen. Um, not intentionally, but you know, there are an awful lot of claims that go out and mistakes do happen. So you want to make sure that you're combing through these things. 80% um, of medical bills will contain an error. It could be a coding error. It could be, have been um, a, a billing error. You got billed for something by accident. You were supposed to have had a test, but then it was decided you weren't going to have the test, but nobody took it out of the record. So the record went to the billing office and all they see is the record. They didn't know who you are or what was done and you got billed for it. Um, and uh, servicing errors in, in terms of how um, insurance companies will process the claims. Um, so you want to do a careful review um, and you may have to request from the provider a detailed itemized bill, including procedure codes, because all they like to do is lump everything together, um, again, giving you less information in hopes of that you don't ask them anything. Um, so you, and you are entitled to get it. So when they tell you that you, they can't give it to them, then you immediately say, I'd like to speak to your supervisor because they can and they have to. Um, and so you need to get that and you need to review that and make sure, did you have all that stuff done to you? Now, if you were in the hospital and you don't really know what was actually done to you, if you're looking at significant charges, you may want to request your medical records and see if it exists in your medical record to see if you were given certain IVs or if certain people came in to see you, if you were billed by someone you don't even know who they are. Um, you want to see, well, if they, if someone did something for you, it will be recorded in that medical record. If it's not there, they can't bill for it. So that's the place that you want to go back to. And you want to compare, um, you want to compare the listing that the insurance company has provided you against the bill that you're getting from the provider. And you want to make sure that they line up and they make sense. And if they don't, then you need to get somebody on the phone on both sides potentially, um, to get them to explain it to you. Again, until you make sure that you really do understand it and it does make sense. Again, don't ever pay anything before you've gone through it. Um, and if you can't do it because you're focused on your health and putting all of your energy towards your health, get somebody who can be your advocate for you. Get a family member who could do it for you. Get a friend who could do it for you. If need be, get a, a patient advocate, a medical billing advocate who will you know, know ex exactly what to do uh, in order to go through all these bills for you because you shouldn't have to pay a penny more than what you're supposed to pay. Um, and even at the end of the day, um, when the bill is there, it doesn't mean that there might not be a way to negotiate some additional savings. And that's the type of thing that, um, that patient advocates ask all the time. Um, other ways to reduce the bills, either through financial assistance programs um, or through um, uh, self-pay self um, settlements that can be put together as well. Um, you want to make sure you've exhausted every option out there, that the bill has been reduced the lowest that it can be before you actually um, pay that bill. So that's in a nutshell, the beginning 
of the journey uh, down the, the road to um, maintaining your financial health um, as you utilize your healthcare benefits.